This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to the International Adult Bible Study uh, Ministry, and welcome to another study of the Word of God. We thank the Lord this day for blessing us all to be here. Let us give praise this morning to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the message, brothers and sisters, and our Lord is always giving us a message in his word. This week, this is his message from the Lord Jesus to Christ. Jesus says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus also said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That is encouraging news, brothers and sisters, because uh, our study uh, in July will talk a little bit more about the light of life, which is Christ our Savior, our creator and redeemer. He came to offer you and me eternal life. And it comes only by the faith in the Son of the living God, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so with this, brothers and sisters, let us take a moment, because we know that these are the promises of the Savior. And we know, according to Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, that God is not a man that he should lie. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for blessing us to be here today. We thank you, Father, for blessing us to make it through another week. We ask and pray, Father, that your blessings might continue to be upon those who listen to this ministry, who desires to do your will and to do your work. I pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, now to allow the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit now take full control of this Bible study ministry. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay. So we are going to get started here, and let me go ahead and minimize my picture here so I can see a little better. I hope everyone can see the screen. And so we are going to be studying for the next uh, four weeks from the book of Isaiah. And it says that we'll be, uh, our first study will start in Isaiah chapter 47, verses 10 through 15. Verses 10 through 15 of Isaiah chapter 47. The mission of the International Bible Study Ministry is to lead the souls of men and women to Jesus to Christ through the teaching of the Word of God. The teaching of the Word of God. Our key verse for this morning, brothers and sisters, comes from Isaiah chapter 47, verse 15. That is all that are you to that is all that are to you. Let me say this again. That is all they are to you. These who dealt, who have dealt with and labored with since childhood, all of them go on in their era. There is not one that can save you. Now there's, as we study this scripture for today, I know it sounds a little bit cryptic, but we're going to get a better understanding of it later on today. It was a little bit cryptic to me trying to read it, and I was the one who put it out there. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and look at a little bit of our biblical background. The month of June, uh, this month, is going to take us to a, a four-part study, four-part study in the book of Isaiah uh, from chapter 47 through chapter 51. Now, we won't be working with all the complete chapter, just parts of those uh, different chapters. It's always good to know a little about the history of our main characters in our studies. Last week, or for the past three weeks, our main uh, character was Paul, the apostle, and the believers in Galatia. And so for the next four weeks, we return to the Old Testament, book of Isaiah, the prophet. We've been there before. This four-part study, or this four-week study, falls under the heading of God delivers and restores. And with our first study titled, God Foretells Destruction. Now, this is important, brothers and sisters, because it tells of what God is about to do to the nation of Babylon. And so there's a lot to unpack. And so I pray that you will um, listen tentatively as we break down the word of God as the Holy Spirit has given me to speak to you today. And as we study 
we may learn a little bit more about the things that are happening in the book of Isaiah throughout these four weeks. Isaiah was witness to one of the most turbulent periods in Jerusalem's history, both politically and spiritually. It says that his relations with the senior members of the royal house as described in the scriptures and the fact that he had free access to the king's palace together with his unique style of prophecies, it suggested that Isaiah belonged to the Jerusalem upper class. But this position, brothers and sisters, did not prevent the prophet from being an outspoken critic in defense of the poor and the outcasts of Judah, who were being victimized by the rapid corruption of the ruling class. Now, the country had fallen into idolatry, and we know from the scripture that is the one thing that God hates the most. It led to uh, worshiping idols, wood and stone. It led to sexual immorality, child sacrifice, which God forbids. Sexual immorality, obviously God forbids, and rebellion against God. Now, the teachings from the book of Isaiah, brothers and sisters, when we approach it chronologically, it revolves around three different historical situations, which are important to our study. One, that Judah was under Assyrian rule in chapters 1 through 39. Two, that Judah would eventually go into exile in Babylon. And we find that in chapters 40 through 55, and those will include our studies for uh, the next four weeks. And three, that Judah, as seen in the early post-exile era, um, in chapters 56 through 66. Isaiah lived and prophesied in the 8th century BC. And as we know from previous studies, brothers and sisters, he was the son of Amos. He was born in the middle of King Uzziah's long reign during a time when there was apparent, apparent stability and prosperity for Judah. Now, the importance of the book of Isaiah is seen in the fact that it is quoted over five dozen times in the New Testament. It goes on to say that his, his prophetic call came in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, which was around 740 B.C., and he prophesied in Jerusalem during spiritually dismal times, even though the country may have seemed like it was prospering, it was during a spiritually dismal time for God's people, though the land seems to have enjoyed their pros pros uh, prosperity. And so what we find is the latest historical event that was recorded by the prophet was the, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, the death of the Assyrian ruler named King Sennacherib, uh, a king and a nation that was known for being the most brutal and ruthless of nations, according to Isaiah chapter 37, verses 36 through 38. Now, the king's demise came soon after the Assyrian army had, who had encamped around Jerusalem and were repair, uh, preparing to go against it. Now, the scriptures tells us that um, the day that um, Hezekiah, king of the southern kingdom of Judah, prayed to God concerning the imminent siege of Jerusalem. His prayer, brothers and sisters, was answered. For the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, who said to King Hezekiah, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 33. And so what we have is that one night, while the Assyrian army slept before preparing to come against Jerusalem the next day, that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians, while they were asleep, 185,000 men. Now, brothers and sisters, don't feel sympathy for these men, 
because they were the most brutal of any army of their time. But we know that God hears the prayers of the righteous. And that is the one thing that we can apply to today in our lives. God hears the prayers of the righteous. Hezekiah was a righteous king. When he prayed, the Lord heard and answered. You and I can learn from, uh, from Isaiah, uh, Hezekiah, rather. When we are walking in the will of the Father, the Lord hears our prayers. When the righteous go through storms in their lives, the Lord goes through it with them. Now, that's encouraging news, brothers and sisters. Our prayers heard by the Almighty, they are heard and they are answered. Now, it may not come when we want it, but God is never late. And it, let it, and it has to be according to God's time, not our time, but God's time when we pray a prayer to him. And friends in Christ Jesus, remember this, again, that God is never late in answering our prayers. And when he answers, he knows what is best for us. So what I'm saying is, there may be those times when we think that our prayers are gonna be answered one way, when they are in fact answered another. So we need to be prepared for that. <clears throat> and so what we find brothers and sisters is that there are two themes in the prophecies of Isaiah, which serve to unite this book. The first is that of the holiness of God, the holiness of God, which was undeniably impressed upon the prophet's mind when he was called to be a prophet of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 writes that, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. This is Isaiah speaking. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. With his head in his hands and believing that he would die, Isaiah could only say, what? Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts." Now, brothers and sisters, Moses hid his face when God spoke to him from the burning bush. We find that in Isaiah chapter, I mean, uh, Exodus chapter three, verse six. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped when he realized that it was the commander of the Lord of hosts that spoke to him in Joshua chapter five, verse four. And so what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is that when, when, we, when we look at the holiness of God, we should see the sinfulness of man, our own sin, and we should fall on our faces just as these men did. The second prominent idea that serves to reinforce the main theme is what is called Zion, Jerusalem. Zion, Jerusalem. It consisted of both the political and center, the political center of the nation and the site of Judah's temple location. Um, it goes on to say, brothers and sisters, that Isaiah was considered the most universal of the prophets of the Old Testament. There were prophecies like Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, which spoke of a future when all nations will come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. All nations 
will come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. It goes on to say, for Jerusalem will be exalted above all other sanctuaries. And I want you to listen to these words, brothers and sisters. It says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days. Now those latter days is, are talking about future events when our Lord returns, when our Lord returns. It says that in the, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. In other words, at the highest peak, at the mountain, on the top of at the highest peak, the, the house of the Lord shall be established and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. And it goes on to say, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It seems that Jerusalem is going to be the center of the earth where it comes to the worship of God. The mountain, the mountains, um, it says that on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the, above the hills, all nations shall flow to Jerusalem. And so it says that there is no doubt, brothers and sisters, excuse me, there is no doubt that the book of Isaiah provides us with the most comprehensive prophetic picture of Christ in the entire Old Testament. And it includes a full scope of the Messiah's life, such as the announcement of his coming. We find that in Isaiah chapter 40, verses three through five. His virgin birth, Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. His proclamation of the good news or the gospel, Isaiah chapter 61, verse one. His sacrificial death, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, through Isaiah 53, verse 12, and his return to his own people, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 2 and 3. But it will be, it will be John the Baptist, which is our study in, in, in July, that will live to introduce us to the coming Messiah spoken of by prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. And so I will say today, brothers and sisters, though coming from the Old Testament, speaks of the coming Savior that we read of in the New Testament. But for now, we focus our timeline given by Isaiah's prophecy, the pending captivity of Judah, and God's divine judgment of Babylon. And that takes us to our study. So what we find in Isaiah chapter 47, verse 10, it says this, for you have trusted in your wickedness. You have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you. And you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. As our biblical title affirms, God foretells destruction. The destruction spoken of in this chapter is the impending fall of the ancient city of Babylon. And so what we know from previous studies in, uh, is that Judah, was captured by the Babylonian army, that they were, um, their captivity was because they refused to obey the prophet's words and they refused to obey God's word. So the law sent them into captivity in Babylon. This is Judah. Now, please listen carefully, friends. Before divine judgment was meted out on Israel and Judah, 
as God always does, he sent prophets. Prophets had come to warn the people to repent and to return to the Lord. Today, today, brothers and sisters, Jesus has sent not prophets, because prophets today, if there are prophets today, they have a special dispensation. But now, our Lord and Savior has sent disciples, us, into the world to warn the nations of impending divine judgment if they will not repent of their sins, believe the gospel, and turn to the Lord. So do you see the comparisons, the, the parallel? In the Old Testament, God sent prophets to warn his people. In a, in a real sense, in the New Testament, today, Jesus has sent his disciples. And we speak of prophecies because we are also preaching the gospel of things that are going to come to pass. So in a, in, a, in a broad sense, disciples, in a broad sense, are also prophets because we are also preaching the gospel of not only redemption and salvation, but of the coming king, the return of the Savior. That's prophecy. And so what we find is that just as Israel and Judah refuse to listen, the world will refuse to listen. And like Israel and Judah, the, the world will fall deeper and deeper into sin. But friends in Christ Jesus, in God's compassion and mercy, he also gave Isaiah a prophecy of someone who would free Judah from captivity in Babylon long before they even went into exile. Over 150 years earlier, God had already prepared to send someone to overthrow the Babylonians and free God's people. That's what it is recorded in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 25, that a man named Cyrus, King Cyrus, would be the one who would destroy Babylon and release God's people to go to their homeland. Listen to these words that comes from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 25. Who says, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure. Saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, your foundations shall be laid. We know that came to pass if you read the book of Ezra, and we've studied that. We know that Jerusalem was rebuilt. We know that the temple was rebuilt. We know that it was Cyrus who came 154 years later and destroyed the Babylonian empire. This was true, not just of Judah, but Isaiah prophesied of another. And we're not talking about Cyrus now. Isaiah prophesies of another who would come not just to redeem Israel and Judah, but all mankind. He goes on to say that King Cyrus set the captives of ancient Babylon free. Jesus has come to set all who are in spiritual captivity, who are in spiritual bondage, free. The time between Isaiah and Jeremiah becoming prophets would be around 113 years. And from the time of Isaiah's prophecy and the beginning of the Babylonian empire, Judah's exile into Babylon would be around 154 years. 
in the making. And so my friends, according to Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, they would remain in Babylon for 70 years. But God's mercy and grace towards his chosen people and God's promise assured the Jews they would return to their land according to Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 12, which he writes, then I will come, then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord. And I will make it a perpetual desolation. I encourage you, friends, to read and to compare Isaiah's words concerning Babylon, ancient Babylon now, with to, to Revelation chapter 18. Our Lord had two plans for the Babylonian Empire. Two plans. One, he was going to use them to bring about an end to the Assyrian Empire who, did, who had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. And two, he would use them to punish the people of Judah because of their idolatry. Second Chronicles chapter 24, verse 18, Isaiah chapter 10, verses 3 through 19. Which re this resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in 586 BC. That's when uh, the Babylonians came in and destroyed Judah. So in Isaiah chapter 47, verses 1 through 9, is the prophecy of the humiliation of Babylon, you see, and its pending fall 154 years before it actually happens. That's the prophecy. And so what you see, brothers and sisters, is that though God has sent Judah into Babylonian captivity because of their sin of idolatry, his wrath came upon the Babylonians now because of their cruel acts towards God's people. They showed God's people no mercy. Listen to uh, Isaiah chapter 47, verse six, verse six. He says, I was angry with my people. I have profaned my inheritance and given them into your hands. Now he's talking about the Babylonians. You show them no mercy. On the elderly, you laid your yoke very heavily. The divine, the prophecy of divine judgment upon Babylon is more, even more clear in verses eight and nine. In fact, brothers and sisters, Isaiah says that in one day, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. He says, they shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries for the great abundance of your enchantments. I, again, I encourage you to read Revelation chapter 18 and compare these, this chapter with Revelation chapter 18. But we must keep in mind, we must keep in mind that the prophecy written was before Babylon became a world power. And God will send his servant Cyrus, according to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 25, to destroy the Babylonian empire and release his people. And so what we have, brothers and sisters, is that the prophet writes this. The prophet writes, he says, you, you, meaning Babylon, have trusted in your wickedness and have said, no one sees me. Babylon's wickedness would be a show, uh, a show of power that was designed to enforce compliance by means of sorcery and divination, along with fear. The phrase, no one sees, implies that the Babylonian empire viewed itself as above being accounted for its action. In verse 11, he says, therefore evil shall come upon you, 
you shall not know from where it arises and trouble shall fall upon you. You will not be able to put it off and desolation shall come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. This is devastating, brothers and sisters. This is devastating. <clears throat> the writings of the book of Isaiah are amazing in that they in that it prophesied destruction of a nation over 150 over 150 years before it occurs only the lord god could have this power and knowledge the disaster disaster that is about to overtake babylon would be like one long night of darkness without dawn that's how terrible it's going to be the word disaster is sometimes used in place of the word evil, which retains the elements of sinfulness. In other words, brothers and sisters, it implies that a moral evil is about to overtake Babylon. And though this consequences comes from the Lord as punishment for, for Babylon's sin, we, you and I, must always remember we must always remember that God does not inflict moral evil on anyone, according to James chapter one, verse 13. In fact, in fact, according to that same chapter, James chapter one, verse 14, we bring it upon ourselves. And so the scripture gives an example in 1 Timothy chapter six, verse nine. And so our Lord, our Lord may, however, allow both moral and physical evils by allowing natural consequences of our own actions. And this is what happened to Babylon. Now, I'll say that again. God may allow, but God does not inflict. God may allow both moral and physical evils by allowing natural consequences of our own actions. So what this verse tells us is that the disaster and the destruction that is to come upon the virgin of Babylon, the cities, it will happen not once, brothers and sisters, but twice, twice. It will come upon this nation suddenly, without notice. In fact, in, nine, in 689 BC, Babylon received a devastating blow by the king of Assyria, King Sennacherib. His army laid waste to the Babylonian cities, but Babylon would recover and be rebuilt to renewed splendor by King Nebuchadnezzar. But it would only be for a time, friends, Babylon would once again flaunt its majesty and, and threaten God's people. And once again, it will bring Judah into captivity this time. And so I want you to listen to the words of Jeremiah, who prophesied after the years of Isaiah. He says this, make the arrows bright, gather the shields, the Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. Now, the kings of the Medes, he's talking about Persia, the Medo-Persia. And in this case, he's referring to King Cyrus, who was a Persian king. For his plan is against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance for his temple. Babylon shall become a heap a dwelling pay place for jackals, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 11 and verse 37. And so this is exactly what happened in 538 BC. In 538 BC, King Cyrus will completely destroy Babylon and release God's people and let them return to the land of Judah. And so in verses 12 and 13, 
we find that it says, stand now with your enchantment. This is Isaiah. Isaiah is saying, he's, this is his prophecy. Isaiah chapter 47, verses 12 and 13. Stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorcerers. He's talking to the Babylonians in which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. He's talking about Babylon. He's talking about what's about to come to Babylon. But you know what's happening here? The words of the prophets, they're words of sarcasm. Stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you. And those speaking over 150 years earlier, nothing can save Babylon, friends, nothing. Not the astrologers, not the stargazers, nor any of their other sorceries will prevent Babylon's destruction. It is determined, God has determined it, and it is going to happen. God's people were commanded not to do these things. In other words, the sorceries and the other things. They had the prophets and they heard the voice of the creator. In other words, God had already told his people at Mount Sinai to refrain from the things that the Babylonians were doing, idolatry, sorcery, witchcraft, all of those things. And so God had already, uh, had already warned his people. They had the prophets, they had heard the voice, and this is critical, they had heard the voice of the creator. And we're talking about all Israel, okay? It says, for the Lord had warned his people not to do as the heathen the heathens did by worshiping idols because it would lead to worse things. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Listen to the words of, Mo of Moses as he gives his last words to the children of Israel before they went into the promised land. Listen to these words. The Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. And so he says, he says this, you saw no form of any kind the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. This is at Mount Sinai. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt, you see, and make for yourselves idols, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or like any animal on earth. Exodus chapter 32, verse 7. Or any bird that flies in the air or like any creature that move along the ground, or any fish in the waters. Deuteronomy in the waters below. Deuteronomy chapter four, verses 14 through 18. And so what you see, my friends, that the Lord has sent Israel and Judah into captivity, captivity because the very words that Moses had warned them of, they committed. And to make matters worse, they rebelled against the commandments of the living God by doing what? By corrupting themselves, of which they first committed in Exodus chapter 32, verse 7, when Aaron made the golden calf while in the wilderness and the people worshiped it. We find brothers and sisters in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. 
Jesus said that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This kind of love prevents us from idolatry and other foolish acts. Now, he says, he goes on to say in Isaiah chapter 47, verses 14 and 15, our last verses, behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not, it shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor fire to set before. Thus shall they be to you with whom you have labored, your merchants from whom from your youth. They shall wander each one to his quarter. No one shall save you. No one shall save you. And so the prophet was speaking of those who claimed to be wise men, who trusted in the stars to guide the people of Babylon. At one time, brothers and sisters, these men were thought to be a source of light in the form of knowledge. Any light, brothers and sisters, any light other than the light which came into the world is no light at all, no light. But the divine light of judgment will expose their dark deeds. In other words, frauds, stubble that feeds the fire. Babylon was once called the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans, uh, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, compared to be a beautiful and desirable virgin, desirable glory to all world powers. The queen of kingdoms, Isaiah chapter 47, verse 5, becomes the biblical symbol for all proud rebellion and all hostility against the Lord and his people. Babylon will fall, friends. Babylon will fall because, it, because of its pride and its arrogance, its idolatries and sorceries, and because of how they mistreated God's people. But brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, there is an eerie parallel to the destruction of ancient Babylon in 689 BC and 538 BC that points to another end time vision of the divine judgment of mystery Babylon during the tribulation period. Now listen carefully, friends. Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Again, I encourage you to read Revelation chapter 17 and 18 to get a full understanding of the parallels between our studies and to keep in mind that the words John, the apostle, spoke of deals with two periods, the city of Rome and its collapse and the sure end time collapse of all human organizations, commerce, or religions that sets themselves up against and ancient, against God as ancient Babylon did in the Old Testament. And so there are some distinct parallels going on here that we should pay close attention to. In the Old Testament of Isaiah that we're studying this month and in Revelation. And so with that, brothers and sisters, that ends our study for today. I pray that we have learned uh, just a little just a little more about uh, what is going on in the book of Isaiah during our studies in Isaiah chapter 47 through 51. And so with that, brothers and sisters, let us take a moment and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word, because we know that your word is truth. 
Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that you would guide our thoughts today. Use us for your glory and for the glory of your kingdom, that we might preach the good news, spread the gospel to all the world for a witness to all nations. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, have a blessed and wonderful day, and I pray that we will meet again next Sunday. Amen.